The Western Virginia Water Authority, located in Roanoke, Virginia, provides drinking water to over 61,000 customer connections in the city of Roanoke and the counties of Roanoke, Franklin, and Botetourt. Customers in these localities, plus the city of Salem and the town of Benton, also receive sanitary sewer service from the authority. Although water supply has been an issue in the Valley as far back as the 1960s, a series of political and severe climatic events starting in 2002 finally compelled the two largest area governments, the City of Roanoke and Roanoke County, to come together to form one water utility, the Western Virginia Water Authority. Franklin County later joined the authority in 2009, and Botetourt County joined in 2015. Most water utilities are owned and operated by the local municipality or a private water system. And this had historically been the case in the Roanoke Valley. However, as was often said during the Water Authority's formation discussions, water doesn't follow jurisdictional boundaries. So why should it be managed that way? Periodic droughts, difficult water sale agreements, and rates that were either not high enough in one locality to support necessary infrastructure improvements or were too high in another locality put stress on the entire Valley's water needs. Then in 2002, the Valley experienced a drought of record. It became abundantly clear that local control was not going to benefit either locality or the region. Instead of having elected officials negotiate a solution, as had been done in the past, staff from the City of Roanoke and Roanoke County laid out a plan to combine the water resources in the Valley to mitigate risk to everyone. The Authority's regional approach has been very successful and is now used as a model showing how to combine and gain synergies for regional water supply and distribution. By combining resources, citizens of both jurisdictions receive better drought protection and rate stability. Expenses for improvements and expansion are spread over a broader customer base, so no single locality or single customer bears the burden of utility capital expenditures alone. The regional Western Virginia Water Authority now has surface water reservoirs, groundwater supply, and improved infrastructure so that the collective Valley community can better withstand water shortages, attract new businesses, and serve its customers. The Western Virginia Water Authority is the steward of multiple water sources. Our surface water reservoirs include Carvin's Cove, a self-contained 6.4 billion gallon reservoir fed mostly by its surrounding watershed. Spring Hollow, a 3.2 billion gallon side stream reservoir that allows water that is selectively pumped out of the Roanoke River to be stored separately from the river. Falling Creek and Beaver Dam Creek, our smaller surface water reservoirs, which collectively store about 520 million gallons of water. And Smith Mountain Lake, where we treat water in partnership with the Bedford Regional Water Authority. Our groundwater sources include Crystal Spring, Roanoke's oldest drinking water source, which can provide as much as 5 million gallons a day. Muse Spring, where we treat water combined from a well system and the spring. And numerous community wells, some which are active sources and others that are on standby for potential future need. with Jamie Morris today. He is the Western Virginia Water Authority's Water Production Manager, and he's going to talk to us a little bit today about some of our surface water sources. Jamie, the Water Authority has five different water sources that are used for drinking water treatment. These are the surface water sources we have. Do all of these water sources have different water chemistry? Yes, they do. And the reason being is that they all have very different depths. Um, they are in different environments. Some are at higher elevations than others, so temperatures are different. Um, they're in different watersheds, so the runoff and the land used around those particular areas are different. And um, 
the water sources themselves. Uh, we have Spring Hollow Reservoir, which is water that is pumped from the Roanoke River. Mm -hmm. And then we have other water sources that are uh, fed by runoff from precipitation events that uh, cross the land and, and drain into the watershed and into the reservoir. And so all of that can can vary the uh, the quality of the water uh, greatly because you can have different nutrient loads that go into the, the water that can feed algae, which can create algal blooms. Uh, the temperature of the water, um, if it's shallow in the, in the temperature um, becomes consistent through the entire water column, you can have turnover and that stirs and mixes the, uh, the reservoir and that can feed algal blooms or bring metals up from the, the sediments into the water column. So yeah, they can be very different. Thanks. Um, it is uncommon for a water utility to have so many different sources. What are the benefits to having that variety of sources? Well, it, it's a blessing to have that many sources. And actually the reason the Water Authority exists is because we merged resources from the city of Roanoke and Roanoke County. They each had two different distinct reservoirs and we were in a drought and we found from that experience that one of the reservoirs was heavily impacted by the drought and the other was not as much impacted. So we were able to share water back and forth. So having multiple sources allows you to diversify from quantity and quality. If you were to have um, a particular problem with the water quality of one reservoir, you may be able to switch to another reservoir and put more demand on that reservoir and that treatment plant to feed your customers. Right. Uh, and we have done research on our reservoirs, but Virginia Tech has also done considerable research at the Water Authority's reservoirs over the years. Can you talk a little bit about that research? Sure. The, the research um, really began back in the late 90s where um, people within the engineering department at Virginia Tech were looking at perfecting uh, oxygenation systems in reservoirs. And by introducing oxygen into the bottom layers of the reservoir, uh, you can mitigate certain problems. You can reduce your algae, you can um, keep your metals uh, in a reduced state so that they don't um, become soluble and then come into the water treatment plant with the water. Um, so that was very beneficial and that was sort of their initial role. Uh, we now have oxygen systems in three of our reservoirs. And um, that research has sort of uh, continued. The, the most recent project that Virginia Tech is working with at Fallen Creek is um, modeling the reservoir. So the reservoir has been modeled and they can kind of predict some of the physical characteristics of what happens during rain events and temperature events. Um, and with that, we're able to tell, um, predict the things traveling across the reservoir as they come from the watershed, um, they'll be introduced into the reservoir and then they'll gradually move their way towards the intake where we're withdrawing water from the reservoir. And so we're able to predict um, certain things like turnover, which I mentioned earlier, can mix the reservoir and bring nutrients and metals up from the bottom. Um, we can predict algal blooms from that and we are working on being able to increase, uh, I'm sorry, um, being able to uh, predict increases in organic carbon, which is very important for us um, when we're looking at things like uh, disinfection byproducts in the treated water. It's very interesting. Um, and it's great to have a partner like um, Virginia Tech to help us and to help our customers. It is. The research that they're doing uh, will be utilized worldwide in, um, in the drinking water industry. Great. Um, now here in the Roanoke Valley, Carvin's Cove is our largest drinking water source. And like many surface water sources across the Commonwealth, it's open for recreation. So as a distribution and reservoir manager um, here at the Water Authority, how do you balance the community's need for high quality drinking water with the public's desire for recreation. Right, well, you have to prioritize and you have to plan ahead. And the priority is that the, the reservoir is a drinking water source. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that that comes before everything else. 
And then in planning ahead, you know, we have a lot of requests and a lot of enthusiasm for different activities that come up from the public. And we have to consider what potential negative effects or impacts those activities could have on the water quality itself. Um, if you're looking at things like biking and hiking in the watershed, you have to be concerned about any erosion that that creates and whether or not that erosion can cause um, soil to get in, introduced into the water itself, which would increase turbidity in, in the reservoir. Um, there may be interest in things like swimming, and that brings up an, another issue where you have human bodily contact with the water itself that can introduce bacteria, it can introduce um, chemicals that we currently don't have in the water, um, such as suntan lotions and, and things of that nature. Uh, so you're introducing chemicals that we currently don't have to deal with in the drinking water. Uh, so those types of, thing, of things have to be looked at and thought of when we're um, mitigating which activities we allow and what we won't allow within the reservoir. Right. Um, and that leads very well into my next question um, about these activities and events in the watershed. Um, both natural occurrences like runoff and erosion and some of the man-made impacts that you just discussed that can come from recreation um, and humans interacting in the watershed. As a public water supplier, we have to monitor and treat for a really wide range of substances found in the water. Can you discuss some of those, um, specifically turbidity and coliform bacteria? Sure. So, uh, as we were talking about erosion and, and activities that can cause erosion, that that material can be introduced uh, from the land into the water, and it can create a couple of issues. It could bring nutrients in with it, uh, things such as phosphate, nitrates, and nitrites, and those are actually food sources for algae. So you could end up with an algae problem by introducing more of those nutrients. But then you have the physical characteristics of the, the dirt in the water itself. And that's what we tend to think of with uh, turbidity. Mm -hmm. So those are particles, some seen, some unseen, that are actually suspended in the drinking water or in the raw water, I should say, before treatment. And um, a couple of different things. It, it's relatively easy to get turbidity out, but one of the reasons you want to remove it is because um, bacteria can hide on those particles of dirt. And if you don't remove the dirt particles, um, the disinfectant that we add, usually chlorine, cannot actually interact with the bacteria and kill it. So it's like a, a protection for the bacteria. So we want to remove that so that we have access to the bacteria and can kill that off. The bacteria that we look for typically are total coliforms. Um, everyone typically knows E. coli. E. coli is a type of total coliform. Not all total coliforms are E. coli, however. Um, but E. coli is a specific one that we know um, comes from the, the gut of warm-blooded animals, and it, it can definitely make people sick. So we want to make sure that that's not there. We monitor total coliforms because they, they're indicator organisms. Not all of them can make you sick, but if we see an increase in those um, total coliforms, we know that something has changed in, in the water quality. And if we have too many, we know that uh, the water quality is deteriorating. So we want to try and pinpoint that source and eliminate it. So some of the things that we're monitoring for are aesthetic, like turbidity, but it can also cause problems if it's not treated or not addressed. Um, some of them are indicators, but then we have other things, um, as you mentioned, like microscopic organisms, such as the E. coli bacteria or cryptosporidium or giardia that come from human or animal waste, leaching septic systems, animals um, out in the watershed. Um, and they can be very common in the environment, but if people ingest food or water that has these organisms in them, they can become very sick. So what are the standards for testing and the treatment techniques to make sure that these harmful substances are eliminated from the drinking water? So we have to monitor the raw water uh, by checking for total coliforms and E. coli, but also for cryptosporidium and giardia. Um, cryptosporidium and giardia are what they call oocysts. So they are similar to viruses. They're, they're not 
technically active biologically, um, but they um, they have a protective shell that kind of uh, protects them from disinfection. So they're hard to, to disinfect and, and kill. Um, the Tetocoliform and the E. coli are bacteria, so they're relatively easy. If you have access to them, they're they're very um, efficiently killed by by disinfection. Um, so we monitor. Uh, we send sampled water off to laboratories that test for Cryptosporidium and Giardia. If we test it and we know that it's not in the raw water, then there's no way that it can be in the drinking water. Great. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about treatment techniques in the next segment of this video, but you've done a great job of kind of sharing with us a little bit about the surface water sources we have, some of the, their unique characteristics, the benefits of having so many, and then just the, the job that's required to make sure that we monitor and manage and treat this water to make sure that we create the best quality product for our customers. So I thank you for being with us today and sharing your knowledge with us. You're very Thanks, welcome. Jamie. Sure. In addition to surface water, the Water Authority benefits from a wide variety of groundwater sources. Groundwater is one of our most valuable resources, even though you probably never see it or even realize it's there. There is water somewhere beneath your feet, no matter where on earth you live. Groundwater starts as precipitation, just as surface water does. But in this case, it seeps into the ground and collects in underground aquifers. Eventually, groundwater emerges back to the surface through wells or springs and continues to participate in the global water cycle. Maintaining these groundwater and surface water supplies is one of the primary goals of the Water Authority and the source water protection efforts under the Safe Drinking Water Act. In 1986, the Safe Drinking Water Act was amended to establish a wellhead protection program. As part of this program, a detailed plan is required to be developed for groundwater sources that addresses the location of the well and the potential risk to the water. In addition to the geology and topography of the land around the well, land use activities such as septic systems, cemeteries, golf courses, fuel storage, landfills, roadways, and agricultural activities must be documented. Chemicals carried by runoff from these structures and activities can contribute to groundwater contamination when they infiltrate through the subsurface and get into the groundwater. Best management practices to mitigate and manage the risk from these watershed contaminants are also detailed in the plan. We'll talk more about some of these watershed activities that can cause water contamination and some best management practices later in the video. In addition to the Wellhead Protection Program, the Authority has worked with the Virginia Department of Health to determine each of our water sources susceptibility to contaminants from surface water. This assessment is a requirement of the Virginia Department of Health Source Water Assessment Program. It is important to protect our valuable groundwater sources because once contaminated, a groundwater reservoir may be permanently degraded or require costly treatment. Harmful nitrates from animal waste, leaking septic systems, or excessive use of fertilizers can contribute to groundwater pollution. Microorganisms in the soil and water change those nitrates to nitrite, which can lead to a reduced amount of oxygen in the bloodstream of someone, particularly an infant, who drinks water with increased levels of these substances. To remove nitrates from water, a costly reverse osmosis, distillation, or ion exchange system must be used. A well that is determined to be under the influence of surface water will require filtration before it can be used as a public drinking water source. The Authority's Crystal Spring, a four and a half million gallon per day spring, had to be removed from service in the early 2000s because it was determined to be under the influence of surface water. The source could not be used for drinking water until a modern ultrafiltration system was put in place to remove any harmful parasitic organism that might be carried by rainwater from the surface of the earth 
to the underground spring. Even though these organisms had not actually been detected in the spring, the opportunity existed for them to travel from the surface of the earth into the groundwater. Now that Crystal Spring has this ultrafiltration system in place, it can be a valuable source of water for the customers of the Western Virginia Water Authority. In addition to removing parasitic organisms from the water, filtration systems are also used to remove turbidity, sediment, bacteria, iron, and manganese. In a groundwater system, the earth's sediment layers can serve as the filtration unit, or an external green sand filter can be added as part of the treatment process. At the Water Authority, surface water sources are filtered through layers of anthracite coal and sand, mimicking the layers of sediment in the earth, or they're filtered with man-made filters, such as polypropylene membranes. Filtration is required of all surface water, but the Virginia Department of Health dictates the type of filter unit used based on the source water and the space constraints of the treatment facility. The Virginia Department of Health also requires that all surface water must be disinfected. Chlorine is a required disinfectant added during the treatment process to eliminate bacteria. If the groundwater has evidence of coliform or E. coli bacteria, chlorine disinfection can be added. Because you can't see the harmful microorganisms and parasites in your water, your drinking water should be regularly tested. Private wells should be tested at least annually for nitrates, nitrites, and bacteria. Water from a public utility is tested for a wide variety of substances on a schedule established by the Virginia Department of Health. The detected amounts of these substances are reported annually in the Consumer Confidence Report. The CCR, or Consumer Confidence Report, is the annual report on water quality published by public water owners and operators. The report provides information about the source of the drinking water, what it contains, and how it compares to the standards set by regulatory agencies based on data collected during the prior calendar year or the most recent testing period. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, requires every public water supplier to provide a CCR for each of their water systems that they operate, and these must be distributed either online or through the mail to their customers. The EPA does not regulate private wells, so there is no requirement for a CCR to be produced by private well operators. The way the information in your report is presented is up to the local water utility, so not all CCRs may look alike. However, there are key elements that are required to be in every report. The reports must provide information about the utility and how to contact the representatives of the utility and other state and federal agencies that set water quality regulations. Customers of the water utility must be able to read the CCR and determine where their water source is located. If the utility, like the Western Virginia Water Authority, has multiple water sources, a map is provided to show the service area for each water source. Information about how the water quality standards are set and definitions for terms used must be included in the CCR. Your water utility tests for a wide range of substances in the drinking water. The amount of each substance detected is reported in the CCR, as well as the parameters for that substance as established by the EPA. If the amount detected exceeds the amount set by the EPA, a violation must be noted, and information about what is being done to correct the violation will be spelled out in the report. The CCR must specifically have a section and testing results for lead and copper. While the water that leaves the Water Authority treatment plants does not show detected levels of lead or copper, older pipe material inside of homes could leach these elements into the water. The Water Authority works with the VDH to randomly sample water from inside the homes of customers in our service area. 
The lead and copper results from those tests are reported in the CCR. In some cases, your utility may be asked to participate in a test for unregulated contaminants. These are contaminants that are able to be detected now that scientific procedures have improved. However, the EPA has not established a drinking water standard for them yet. Information from water utilities across the country is gathered to determine where these contaminants occur and whether they should have regulations established in the future. If you have questions about your drinking water, you should contact your local water utility or read their CCR. Watershed is a land area that channels rainfall and snowmelt to creeks, streams, and rivers, and eventually to outflow points such as bays and oceans, an area of land that drains to a body of water. When it rains, some water will be absorbed into the ground and get into our groundwater. But water runoff can pick up fertilizer, pesticides, dirt, bacteria, and other pollutants as it makes its way to our ponds, streams, lakes, rivers, and ocean. Best management practices or BMPs can be used to prevent or reduce this type of pollution from happening. BMPs can be the most effective and practical means of preventing or reducing non-point source pollution. For example, you've probably known someone who has used fertilizer on their lawns or crops to help them grow. A soil test will tell you how much, if any, fertilizer your lawn needs. Remember to apply only the amount of fertilizer needed. And while fertilizers can be helpful, whether they are chemically produced or natural fertilizers such as cow or horse manure, using too much fertilizer can be harmful. Too much fertilizer reaches a waterway, it can lead to water quality problems such as algae. Too much algae is harmful to a lake system as it blocks sunlight and prevents other plants from growing. When it dies and decays, it also takes much needed oxygen away from fish. This is called eutrophication. Use the right fertilizer and use it carefully and responsibly. Don't use fertilizers before it rains and avoid using fertilizers on steep slopes. Pesticides. Many people enjoy planting a garden and look forward to a feast of tomatoes and vegetables until they spot a growth or fungus on a stem. Farmers want to produce healthy crops, but can be beset by weeds and insects. People want to enjoy an evening outside without fearing a mosquito bite. Pesticides are a substance or mixture that kills a pest or it prevents or reduces the damage a pest may cause. Pests can be insects, mice, or other animals, unwanted plants, weeds, bacteria. Just like fertilizers, they need to be used properly and responsibly. Identify the pest, disease, or cause of the problem. Learn when and what pesticides are needed. Select chemicals that are the least toxic or that break down quickly. Always read the label before mixing and applying pesticides. What is the difference between weathering and erosion? Weathering breaks down or dissolves rock, but does not involve movement. Erosion is the process by which natural forces like wind or water move weathered rock and soil from one place to another. Erosion can occur naturally or it can be created by humans. When soil is bare, rainwater will run quickly over it. The moving water picks up soil particles. These soil particles have phosphorus attached to them. Some soils are high in phosphorus and are another source of phosphorus in water runoff. Runoff can end up in your local lake or stream and contribute to algae growth. So what are a few BMPs we can utilize to prevent erosion? Learn about landscaping practices that prevent it, such as protect soil by planting ground cover vegetation. Gardens and construction sites with areas of bare soil, especially on slope land, are prone to erosion. Use a silt fence to prevent runoff. Use the mulch setting on a mower and start grass cycling. Just leave the grass on the lawn. It provides needed nutrients to the soil and grass. Plant native shrubs and maintain grass and natural vegetation to help water quality by soaking up rainfall, reducing runoff, and retaining sediment. 
If you have cows, horses, or other animals that like to cool off in a nearby stream, consider placing a fence or another buffer or barrier to keep them out of the water. Why? This chart shows the amount of harmful E. coli bacteria in specific animals' waste. Cows have a very large amount of E. coli in their waste, and other animals are then compared to them. So if you take an animal that poops in the water, like a beaver, you can see that it would take 165,000 beavers pooping to add up to the same amount of E. coli that one cow poops. And while we're talking poop, don't forget to dispose of pet waste properly. Pet waste can wash into streams, rivers, or lakes and contribute to nutrient pollution. Pet waste can contain disease-carrying organisms. Use a baggie to pick up your pet's poop when walking your dog. Dispose of pet waste properly. We all live in a watershed. Let's protect it. For more information on the Environmental Protection Agency's Safe Drinking Water Act, visit epa.gov sdwa. To learn more about the Virginia Department of Health's Office of Drinking Water, their drinking water standards, source water programs, drinking water data, and more, visit their website. The Western Virginia Water Authority also offers more resources. Visit our YouTube channel, where you can take tours of our treatment facilities and review your watershed knowledge. Our website includes information about our service area and how we treat drinking water for our customers. You can also find our CCR there. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Find us in all of our online locations.